Well, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us for the great debate series here in Michigan. Tonight's topic is central to the truth of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus. According to 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus was not raised, then our faith is useless as Christians, and, our, and we are false witnesses about God. So tonight's debate is extremely important, it is foundational to the truth of Christianity. Before we begin again, I would like to say please, cell phones, maybe take one last time to check, make sure they're on vibrate or they are off. And I think that is all I have announcement-wise, so let's get to our debaters. Our Muslim apologist today is Osama Abdullah. He is the founder and director of www.answering dash christianity.com he is married he has a lovely wife and son and i believe they are with us here today i see his wife is here thank you for coming and he has a master's in computer science our christian apologist is dr nabil qureshi who is co-founder of act 17 apologetics ministry he he has his medical doctorate from east virginia medical school and his Master's of Christian Apologetics from Biola University. Nabil's website can be accessed at www.answeringmuslims.com. Our format tonight is going to be set up as this. Each debater will have 30-minute opening statements. They will then do 15-minute first rebuttals, followed by 8-minute second rebuttals, and 5-minute conclusions. All right, that's all that I have for you. Let's begin with Nabil. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Nabil and I'm with Acts 17 Apologetics. And before I begin, I'd like to start with a prayer. For those of you who are Christian in the room, please follow along. For those of you who are not, feel free to do so as well. Holy God, we praise you for being king over our lives. Lord, we come to you in, in worship and reverence, Lord. Everything we do, we do for your glory, God, or at least we should. And we ask that you would take this evening and glorify yourself through it. Praise you and pray in the holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, uh, i got to preface this whole debate with an introduction. Uh, I would have to say that yesterday was probably the craziest day of my life. Uh, it was definitely the first time I'd ever uh, been uh, a victim of assault and battery by security guards. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, we were at the Arab Fest yesterday, and uh, we were simply asking a question. There was a booth there that was giving out pamphlets, and we went to the booth, and we said, we have a camera, can we record you? Ultimately, they said yes, and I said, we have a question. And we started to ask it. Before you know it, security guards were all around us. Uh, I'm really condensing this. But long story short, um, me, my mission partner, David Wood, and our friend, Mary Jo, were all uh, physically assaulted and uh, hit multiple times. Um, so, it's been a crazy night, let me say that. Uh, the adrenaline has been pumping ever since yesterday. Uh, we've talked to media, we've talked to lawyers, uh, we've talked to all sorts of people. Um, long story short, I'm about as frazzled as I've ever been before today, um, which, Osama, bodes really well for you. So, uh, if there's never ever a time to just uh, to, to take advantage of the situation, that is today, um, then again, I beat you. <laughs> okay, so let us begin. Um, the question today is, did Jesus rise from the dead? As Mary Jo has said, this is extremely foundational to the tenets of Christianity. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. In fact, Romans 10.10 10 lists the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection as one of the clear indications of what we need to believe in order to be saved. So, did Jesus rise from the dead? The question can be addressed in many ways. First and foremost, though, we have to point out that this is a historical question. If Jesus Christ was a man who lived in the first century, which we all say he was, Muslims and Christians alike, then this is a man who lived. Investigating his life is a historical process. It's not something you do only theologically, only philosophically. There are actually historical records. In fact, we have more historical records of the life of Jesus than virtually anyone else from his time era, his era. Um, do you all know who the emperor was at the time of Jesus? It was Tiberius. Now, Tiberius is the emperor of Rome. And how many sources do we have on the existence of Emperor Tiberius? Ten. How many 
many sources do we have on the existence of Jesus, a carpenter in a province of that empire? Forty. So you have four times as many references to the life of Jesus as you do to, this, uh, to the emperor of his time. That's amazing. So we know that Jesus Christ was a man who can be investigated historically because we have over 40 sources that deal with his existence. Surprisingly, approximately 24 that have to do with his crucifixion, and we'll be talking about that as we go along. So, Jesus was a man who lived in the first century. We're supposed to investigate this question, did Jesus rise from the dead, from multiple perspectives, but first and foremost, it should be from a historical perspective, because the question is historical. It's an event. Did he rise from the dead? That would be an event, so we approach it as history. In order to do this, we're going to look at two types of evidence. We're going to look at direct evidence and supporting evidence. If you're, if you're making outlines, don't outline that. I'm just explaining to you what types of evidence we're going to be using. Direct and supporting evidence. Now, direct evidence is something along the lines of someone saying, Jesus died on the cross, or Jesus rose from the dead. Those are direct evidences for those concepts. If there's a witness who says it, or if there's someone who reports it from a witness, that's direct evidence. Historically speaking, it doesn't get too much better than that. Supporting evidence would be something such along the lines of scholars all believe X, Y, or Z. Now this is something that's supporting. It's not primary evidence, it's supporting evidence. Or if you look at this verse over here, you can interpret this to mean these sorts of things, if they're not direct statements about Jesus' death or resurrection, are all supporting statements. So we're going to be looking at this, and we're going to be looking at all our evidences and classifying them as we go along, direct and supporting. So, to lay out the argument, I'd like to point out two things. If these two things are true, then we can reasonably conclude that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Number one, that Jesus died on the cross. And number two, that Jesus was later alive. Those are the two facts we're going to discuss. Number one, Jesus died on the cross. And number two, Jesus was later alive. If we can prove or show with, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that these two things are well defended, then my case will stand very strongly. So first, did Jesus Christ die on the cross? Now, let's look at the direct evidence. First, we have so much evidence that Jesus died on the cross that is mind-numbing. In fact, every single ounce of evidence that we have for the first hundred years after Jesus' death, and most of it beyond that, says that Jesus died on the cross. All the evidence that we have from Jews, such as Josephus, Marabar Serapion, and the Talmud, these three Jewish sources say Jesus died on the cross. Gentile sources, such as Tacitus, Lucian of Samosata, these are Gentile sources that say Jesus died on the cross. And of course, we have the early generation of Christians who say Jesus died on the cross. For example, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, and the author of Hebrews. All these separate individual authors say Jesus died on the cross. And what about second-generation Christians, such as Papias, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Ignatius? These are all Christians from within one century after Jesus' death, all of whom say Jesus died on the cross. Now understand what we have. We have an event. This is the event we're studying historically. And every single source that we can possibly investigate all agree that Jesus died on the cross. Keep this in mind as we go further through the evidence. Now, I have just laid out that all the written testimony that we have points out that Jesus died on the cross, but we also have some extremely early written evidence that does the same thing. Paul, for example, was writing just a few decades after Jesus' death, and some of what he includes in his writing were even earlier. We'll discuss that shortly. Uh, the author of Mark is contested to have written the gospel somewhere around maybe 50, 60, or 70, but usually a lot of the people that, um, who investigate this issue will say it's as early as 50. Just, again, just a couple decades after Jesus' death. We also have the author of Hebrews who explicitly mentions the death of Jesus Christ. This is the earliest stratum of Christian authors who say Jesus died on the cross. But even earlier than this, uh, if you guys have been falling asleep, come on back up here. Let's, let's, let's pick this up a notch. Even earlier than this, we have creeds. Creeds found in the earliest Christian writings which go back to the very first generation of Christians. Now I'm talking predating the actual writing of the New Testament. Well, what does this mean? We have creeds in the New Testament that predate the writing of the New Testament? Well, yes. For example, in Philippians 2, we have the Carmen Christi. Now the Carmen Christi is a song of sorts. It's, it's, an, it's a hymn, it's a creed, which shows what Jesus did um, as he was first God, who did not believe that deity was something to be held onto, but emptied himself, made, him, made himself in the form of a man, a servant. Uh, who would die on the cross. This statement here is the beginning of the Carmen Christi. And if you examine the words in the Carmen Christi, you'll notice 
that this is an, a creed that Paul is quoting from before him. In fact, this isn't something that he makes up uh, because we know that the way he approaches this creed, it, it assumes that the church at Philippi is very well familiar with this creed. In fact, uh, Larry Hurtado, um, scholar of uh, Christology in England, has stated that the creed probably predated Paul's conversion to Christianity. And when did Paul convert? In the first two years of, uh, two to three years of the Christian message. He has reasoning for saying that. If someone would like to object to it, we can discuss that. But we have super early information. Now this, like I just said, is two to three years after Jesus died, and it says that Jesus is dead on the cross. That is strong testimony, but is that the only one? No. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, also a very early creed. In fact, atheists and agnostic scholars were the ones to determine that this creed was as early as it is. Marcus Borg, one of the most skeptical scholars uh, when it comes to Christianity that is out there, has said that this creed, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, is no later than months after Jesus' death on the cross. Months. You cannot get anything earlier in history than that. You're talking about the writing of Alexander the Great hundreds of years after he died. You're talking about the writings about Julius Caesar hundreds of years after he died. You're talking about the writings of Muhammad, the prophet of Arabia, hundreds of years after he died. But 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 8 says very clearly Jesus died on the cross, and we have agnostic and atheist scholars saying that this came no more than months after his death. It doesn't get any better than this. The evidence, again, this is direct evidence that is as strong as it can be from multiple sources on multiple strata of history. Now, as I have said, every single uh, piece of direct evidence that we have concerning Jesus' death on the cross all says that he died on the cross, uh, and it, all the ones from within one century after Jesus' death say this. There is nothing, and I mean, this is obviously something you can deduce from what I just said, but there is nothing contrary to the fact that people said he died on the cross. There is no shred of evidence against this. Every single thing says he did, no one says he didn't. Now think about it for a moment. If it were even plausible that Jesus Christ could die on the cross, would not have someone said it. People were looking for excuses to say that he did not rise from the dead. Why not just come up with the idea that he didn't die on the cross? We know, for example, the Jews, according to the Gospel, said that his body had been stolen. Well, if they're looking for excuses on him not having died on the cross, or not having risen from the dead, why not just say he survived the cross? Because everyone knew that surviving the crucifixion is impossible. And I'm going to qualify that statement shortly. Uh, you know what? I'll go ahead and qualify it now. When Romans were crucifying people, they didn't take chances. For, for one, the Roman centurions who crucified people did this for a living. This is their job. They were good at what they did. It's not too hard to kill people if that's what you're doing. It's pretty easy. And they made sure they do it because if a prisoner escaped from crucifixion or the death sentence or even prison, that guard was liable to be killed by his own government. So these Roman centurions were not lax at what they did. They take a lot of care in what they were doing. So, we know that the guards can do it easily, they take extra care to do it, and what was the process of crucifixion? First, we know that during the process of crucifixion, the beating was brutal. We have statements from early Christian, I'm sorry, from the, early, from the Christian era, and even earlier, which say that crucifixion itself was like the pre-death, the death before dying. It's a scourge. It's, it, one person even says that when these victims were crucified, ribbons of flesh were hanging from their body. And what do we know about Jesus Christ? Read the book of John carefully. If you read the book of John, Pilate presents Jesus Christ before the crowd, and he says, here's your man. He doesn't want Jesus to be crucified. But they still want him to be crucified, so he says, let me flog him first. He takes him to be flogged, and then he brings him back saying, what about now? Do you still need him to be crucified? Think about it for a moment. If he was just doing what he expect, they expected him to do, would he have re-asked the question? No, it's quite likely that he actually flogged Jesus to the point of near death, way more than usual flogging, in order to appease the crowd as a substitution for the crucifixion. But they didn't be, they were not appeased, and Jesus was carried on to the cross. What else do we know about crucifixion? I like talking about um, the medical aspect of it because it's about the only time I get to use my medical degree. Um, 
when Jesus is uh, on the cross, whenever any man is placed on the cross, their arms are hyperextended. In other words, their chest is expanded and it's hard, it is extremely hard to breathe out. They need to somehow uh, pull their arms back in so that their chest can produce that positive pressure in order to breathe out the air. But how do they do that? Imagine you're hanging, your arms are hanging off, you're hanging from your arms on the cross. How in the world are you going to get yourself to bring those arms down? Well, you don't. You push your body up. And how do you do that? By lifting up off your feet. And what is running through your feet? A nine-inch nail. So every time Jesus Christ wanted to breathe out, he had to push up against a nail that's going through both his feet. What is the point of me saying this? The point is that when a, a man is on the cross and he is not pushing up anymore, you know he is dead. And it's not hard to see a man pushing up. This is also the very reason why the two criminals on either side of Jesus uh, had their knees broken. Because simply breaking their knees made it impossible for them to push up off their feet, which meant they could no longer breathe. Breaking of the knees is one type of death blow that the Romans used in order to kill a prisoner if it was time to kill them. There were other methods, such as crushing their head, letting wild animals eat the body, and of course the one used on Jesus Christ, a spear thrust through the heart. Each of this was meant to be uh, a different method of ensuring the death of the prisoner. And Jesus Christ received a death blow. There is not a single record of anyone in history who has gone through a full Roman crucifixion and survived. Now, there are accounts of people who were pulled off the cross before the death blow who survived. And even then, only after Roman medical attention, the best that they could provide, and even then, um, multiples of them died as well. Two-thirds of them would die as well, without receiving the death blow. So Jesus Christ, on the cross, receiving the punishment designed to kill people in the most painful, humiliating way possible, and you, uh, you have to wonder, would the Romans do a good job of what they're hired to do and what their very life depends on? We can talk more about practice of Roman crucifixion, should a son choose to go in that direction. So what do we talk about? We've talked about the direct evidence uh, so far. We've talked about, number one, all the written testimony says Jesus died. Number two, especially the earliest testimony, which goes within months of Jesus uh, being on the cross. We have nothing to the contrary except possibilities of twisted interpretations which we will possibly see those come out later. And finally, the practice of Roman crucifixion was guaranteed to kill a victim. And we know Jesus was crucified. If anyone says anything to the contrary, I'd like to see the evidence. However, that's just a direct evidence. We've only begun to talk. Uh, we also have supporting evidences. According to virtually every New Testament historian, I'm sorry, every historical Jesus historian who is alive today, Jesus died on the cross. Virtually no one, and certainly no major scholars who studied Jesus' life, say that he survived the cross. What are the kinds of things these people say? Now I'm going to quote to you atheist and agnostic scholars who study the death and life of Jesus. Atheist New Testament scholar Gerrit Ludemann declares that Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. John Dominic Crossan of the infamous Jesus Seminar says that there is not the slightest doubt of the fact of Jesus' death, Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. According to Crossan again, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. That he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. Atheist scholar John Dominic Crossan. Marcus Borg, another member of the Jesus Seminar, states that Jesus' execution is the most certain fact about the historical Jesus. Jewish scholar Giza Vermi says that the passion of Jesus is part of history. Another Jewish scholar, Pincus Lapid, said, concludes that Jesus' death by crucifixion is historically certain. And according to Paula Fredrickson, the most single, single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover in the manner Rome preserved particularly for political insurrections, namely crucifixion. Since no discussion of non-Christian scholars will be complete without Bart Ehrman, here's what Bart Ehrman says. One of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on the orders of Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. 
I can give you a parade of scholars who say that Jesus died on the cross because every single major scholar who writes today says that Jesus died on the cross. There is no evidence to say to the contrary. Anyone who argues to the contrary is arguing from a non-historical perspective, a non-evidential perspective. Anyone, in other words, who is arguing against the death of Jesus Christ is arguing from an alternative agenda. We also have prophecies in the Old Testament of Jesus' death. Uh, we don't need to talk about them right now. I think the historical approach is more than enough, but if someone would like to come in that direction, he can feel free. So we had two pieces of evidence that we were going to discuss today. Number one, that Jesus died on the cross, and we have amply ascertained that he did. There is no reason to think otherwise. And number two, that he was alive later. Now that's a big leap to make. How can we just assume that he was alive later? Isn't it possible that people were hallucinating his reappearance? Isn't it possible that he never died on the cross, that he just swooned? Isn't it possible that Jesus had a twin? That is a theory, an alternate theory. Jesus had a twin. Uh, my favorite alternate theory is the super alien theory. Super aliens came and replaced Jesus. Isn't it possible? Well, it sure is. But what does the evidence say? Let's take a look at that. Um, Jesus, the fact that Jesus was alive can be evidenced by three major facts. Let's turn to them now. Number one, the tomb in which Jesus was laid was empty a few days after his crucifixion. Now, there, are, there is direct evidence for this point again. So allow me to give you the direct evidence and its statements from multiple sources that the tomb was empty after Jesus' death. So again, we have as good evidence as historically you can get. Statements from people saying, uh, statements from contemporary people, multiple contemporary people saying that Jesus' tomb was empty. Let us now consider the secondary evidence. How much time do I have left, by the way? 10 minutes? The Jerusalem factor. The fact that Jesus' tomb was in Jerusalem made it possible for anyone to check and see whether, the, whether or not the tomb was empty. If people are going around saying, Jesus, rose from the dead, anyone could have just gone to the tomb and if his body was still there, say, look, he didn't raise from the dead, his body is still here. Therefore, we know, since there were people looking for ways to show that Jesus was not the risen Lord, we know that his tomb must have been empty because if it weren't, people would have used that as evidence against his resurrection. Again, this is supporting evidence, but it's strong. Number two, enemy testimony. Again, we hear the Jews say that the disciples stole the body. Someone stole the body, and therefore the tomb is empty. Well, if you have the enemies of a certain group agreeing with you, for example, Christians are saying the tomb is empty because he rose. The Jews are saying, no, the tomb is empty because the body was stolen. Well, guess what? You have opposition agreeing with you that the tomb is empty. Maybe for a different reason, but the tomb is empty on all accounts. So there's enemy testimony. And finally, there's the testimony of women. If anyone were going to make up the story of the tomb being empty, they would not have used women as the people who would discover the empty tomb. Why is that? Because in that time in Jerusalem, if any women were to say anything, their testimony was worth nothing. Absolutely nothing. So you could have a hundred women versus one man. If one man says one thing, a hundred women say another. That one man wins the day. That's how little uh, reverence people had towards a woman's um, uh, statements. So why in the world would the story of the crucifixion and resurrection, the story that is meant to change lives across the world, be started by the testimony of women? Well, only if, those, if that story is true. No one would make something like that up. There's no reason to make that up. There's nothing to gain from saying that women um, were the ones who found him. And therefore, uh, the testimony of women is more supporting evidence for the fact that the tomb was empty. So we have our first piece of evidence, supported by direct and supporting evidence, that, the two, uh, that Jesus was alive later. Let's look at the next link in the chain. Jesus was believed alive by his followers. After Jesus was dead, he was later believed alive. The disciples, we all know this, disciples preached that Jesus died and that they wouldn't, and uh, later they believed that he was risen. In fact, they started worshiping him as the risen Lord. In fact, they then later went on and died for that belief, preaching it. They died for that belief. Now, who, in the right mind, would die for something that is a lie? The disciples were in a position to know whether or not they had seen the risen Jesus. They wouldn't die for a lie. So, if they saw the risen Jesus, I'm sorry, if they died for the belief that Jesus was risen, they at least believed that he was risen. They wouldn't die for something that they thought was a lie. 
However, we also see, um, oh, and I can uh, give you some supporting evidence. So that's the direct evidence that they preached that Jesus had died and that he had risen. The supporting evidence, of course, is a scholarly consensus again. Garrett Ludemann says, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. So Gerd Ludemann agrees, Paula Fredrickson says, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. And Bart Ehrman says, it is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his execution. So, the fact is that he was believed to be alive by his followers. Again, this is something that all historians agree with. Finally, Jesus' opponents believed that he was risen. Let's get the direct evidence for that as well. Paul states very clearly that he believed Jesus was risen. And we know that Paul, from multiple sources, that Paul was an enemy of Jesus during uh, the early phase of Christianity. So someone who was Jesus' enemy then turns around and says, I have seen the risen Jesus. Well, why would he say such a thing? We'll get to that in a moment. That's the direct evidence we have that there were enemies of Paul who believed he was risen. But we also have supporting evidence. James, the brother of Jesus, is said in the book of Acts to have been a leader in the, of the church in Jerusalem. But how in the world would James have been a leader of the church of Jerusalem if he was an enemy of Jesus during the Gospels? And we know he was. But well, we can infer that he believed in the risen Jesus. And we actually see this confirmed in extra-biblical sources. Finally, the Jews uh, saying that Jesus' body was gone is more support that he was not in the tomb anymore, therefore potentially risen. So what we have is direct and indirect evidence supporting three facts. Number one, the tomb was empty. Number two, that he was believed to have been seen by his disciples. And number three, that enemies of Jesus believed that they saw Jesus risen. So let's take these facts. If you've been following along, let's connect the dots. What in the world does all this mean? First, Jesus died on the cross. We know that. Two, his tomb was then empty. Three, his uh, believers, or his followers, said they saw him risen, or at least they believed it. And four, his opponents believed that they saw him risen. What can account for these four facts? Only one thing, that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Nothing else can account for these facts. For example, the number one opposing theory espoused by people who do espouse a theory is called the hallucination theory. Approximately 5% of scholars who investigate the historical Jesus have this theory uh, that they espouse. They say that multiple people must have hallucinated the, uh, the coming of Jesus, and therefore they believe to have seen him risen. Um, and this is how the Jesus story began. Well, this doesn't quite fit the story, because we know that multiple hallucinations, a mass hallucination, has never happened. It's never happened any time in history. In fact, it seems that in order to circumvent the miracle of Jesus' resurrection, they have to create a miracle of mass hallucinations. So this mass hallucination theory doesn't work on that account, but also, why in the world would Paul, a persecutor of Christianity, and James, an enemy of Christianity, hallucinate the risen Jesus? There's no reason. There's no motive. There always is an underlying reason for hallucination. Uh, at least that's what I've been taught in medical school. And if people do not have this underlying motive, then there is no reason to think that they hallucinated him whatsoever, especially if there's no evidence. So, the resurrection, however, fits all four facts. That, number one, he was killed. Number two, the tomb was empty. Number three, his followers believed him risen. And number four, his enemies believed him risen. The resurrection fits all four of those facts very well. And by the way, scholars across the world agree with these four facts. Jesus scholars. The first fact is believed that Jesus died on the cross by virtually all scholars. The second fact, the empty tomb, is agreed upon by about 75 to 80 percent of Jesus' scholars. Number three and four, that his believers believe him to have been risen and his opponents believe to have seen him risen. Those two facts are believed by over 95 percent of scholars who write upon the risen Jesus. Agnostic, atheist, Christian, you name it. So these four facts are agreed upon by everyone virtually, and if Osama wants to reject any of these facts, then I'd appreciate a reason why he's going against virtually everyone's opinion. So, what do we have in conclusion? Number one, Jesus died, and number two, he was risen. It is my understanding that Osama will probably focus on, number one, Jesus' death on the cross, because the Quran says in chapter 4, verse 157, that Jesus was not killed, nor was he crucified, but was made to appear to them or to the people who were there. Um, this is the Islamic position. 
Note, there is no evidence for this position whatsoever. There's no reason to believe it. There's no uh, direct evidence. There's no early evidence. There's nothing of the sort which would cause you to believe this except that Muhammad and or the Quran said it. It's the only reason you believe it. And I challenge someone to provide me a reason otherwise. Um, the other objections I'm expecting Osama to bring, and uh, I will allow him to bring it, um, are objections from the Old Testament. Uh, it's uh, an attempt to take verses of the Old Testament to try to show that Jesus did not rise from the dead. Um, that, and, and, sorry, that Jesus would not die on the cross. Uh, we will allow him to, to do that if he wishes. Keep in mind, though, as he's presenting these evidences, note what he will be saying. He will be saying things along the lines of, look at this verse. Clearly, this man would not die. However, those verses generally do not apply to Jesus at all. They're applying to a general statement. They're not prophecies about the Messiah. So watch the verses that he'll bring. See if these are statements about the coming Messiah or about men who are just attempting to pray to God. Also see if what he's saying actually is reflected in the text. Sometimes, uh, I debated with someone in my hometown not long ago, uh, we debated on the topic of the science in the Quran, or the, the miraculous nature of the Quran. And many times I noticed that Osama would read scripture and interpret it to mean something it did not say at all. So watch for that as well during his opening statement. I'm hoping uh, that he has an excellent case because I would love to see good arguments against the risen Jesus just so we can sharpen our swords. Um, Osama, I will now turn the floor over to you. Jesus striking of his feet against a rock, 
That's in Psalm 91, verse 12, by the way, it's mentioning that it mentioned that. This piece about striking the foot is very minor in the chapter because the chapter is more focused on one, God Almighty will hear his cries. That's the Messiah. Okay? God Almighty will save him. Uh, the first one was Psalm uh, 91, uh, verse uh, 5. And uh, the second one here, uh, God Almighty will save him. Psalm 91, verse 3. God Almighty will cover him with his protection. That's verse 4 in the book, Psalm 91. Um, Christ will, or the Messiah or the person will then not have any fear in him. That's verse 5. Christ will observe, or the, the person will observe with his own eyes the punishment of the wicked ones. That's the crucified ones. That's in uh, verse 8. And also according to the Noble Quran, the original uh, writings of the disciples of Jesus, uh, uh, and also uh, according to the Noble Quran and the, uh, and the uh, original writings of the disciples of, of, of Jesus in Palestine and neighboring countries like Egypt, uh, uh, they state clearly that uh, Jesus did not get crucified. Uh, also, according to the Apocalypse of Peter that was discovered in Egypt, Jesus sat on the tree and watched the crucified one getting crucified. Okay? Peter witnessed this and wrote the, wrote the Apocalypse. Apocalypse means revelation, by the way. It's a, it's a, um, a Latin word. Uh, not only that, but uh, with uh, all Greek word, rather, Apocalypse. Not only that, but uh, while Christians uh, insist that the book is a Gnostic one, but according to Wikipedia, uh, org, uh, here uh, it said about the Gnostic uh, Gospel, of, the Coptic Gospel of Peter, Apocalypse of Peter, says it is unclear whether this text advocates adoptionist, which is Jesus was divine, or uh, decadist, which is Jesus' body will have, uh, and crucifixion or illusional Christology. So it's not clear. They're not sure whether it's Gnostic or not. So there's no proof that the book is Gnostic. Christians explain that. And by the way, if you watch the band from the Bible uh, film, uh, John Dominic Crossan, that uh, my respected opponent here, Dr. Nabil Qureshi, had quoted, he said that the Apocalypse of John, which is the book of Revelation, and the Apocalypse of Peter, people, uh, the, the, there was a conflict uh, among them, which one was going to make it to the canon and which was going to be thrown out. And ultimately they chose the Apocalypse of John, which is today's book of Revelation. But he said that the book of uh, Apocalypse of Peter was popular in the first two centuries, first 200 years, or 170 if you want to subtract 30 years. Um, so, that's Jesus' life by the way, 33 years. So, it, it was popular, and there were Christians, early Christians, who did not believe Jesus was crucified. And uh, by the way, continuing on with the psalm, uh, no harm or disaster will even come near the person. That's Psalm 91, chapter 10. This even contradicts him getting beaten up. Uh, or again, being uh, beaten before crucifixion. God Almighty will send down angels to protect him and lift him. Okay, that's Psalm 91, verses uh, 11 and 12 and 14, and also Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. Um, not even his foot uh, will strike the ground from his enemies, pushing and grappling and punishment. Uh, here, I mean, I'd like to quote uh, verses 11, 12, and 14 for you from Psalm 91. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their, with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. For he acknowledges my name. Okay? Jesus, if Jesus was killed on the cross and buried, First, he would, he, would not, he would have been killed, obviously, he would not have been saved, and his cries would not have been heard, and um, he would not have been lifted by the angels. So there's a clear uh, contradiction there. And again, the New Testament verses uh, uh, that I quoted about the uh, conversation between Satan and, and, and Jesus, Jesus confirmed it. He said, yes, but also the scriptures also say, do not tempt your Lord, uh, your God. So Jesus confirmed, he, he conceded that, or accepted that, yes, these verses are talking about him. Moving on, uh, the person's call will be heard, and he will be delivered and honored. Psalm 91, verses, uh, verse 15, and Isaiah chapter 52, verse uh, 13 again. Here, uh, verse 15 in Psalm 91 says, He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will protect him and honor him. 
His life, and also uh, moving on, it says here, his life will be prolonged, and he will live and even to see his own offspring. So that's Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, which I will get into get to uh, shortly. Book of Isaiah show you that it's mistranslated, and what you have today that says that he will uh, die for our inequities and things, that's all mistranslation, mis uh, deliberate mistranslations. Um, so that's Isaiah 53, verse 10, and Psalm chapter 91, verse 16. Uh, moving on, uh, by the way, and also it says here, his life will overpower death. That's Isaiah 53, verse 12 again. Um, important note here, Psalm 91 is speaking about a number of prophecies that will take place. He will call upon me. I will rescue him. I will send my angels. I will. He will. I will. He will. It's promises. It's uh, prophecies that, about things that will happen in the future. They are not just general statements as my opponent uh, uh, tried to convince you with in, his, in the ending of his uh, presentation. They're not just general statements about, oh, God just saves the righteous. No, they're not that. Okay, there are tons of those in the Psalm, books of Psalm. There's probably 50 of them that I, I found myself that I did not use. Okay, um, because, yeah, they're general. They're too general. But these are specific about the Messiah. And the New Testament, Jesus in the New Testament confirmed it, that they are about Him. Um, also here in Psalm chapter 20, verse 6, um, now I know that the Lord saves the anointed king, which Jesus, by the way, was an anointed king. He answers him for, uh, from his holy heaven, the power of God's right, uh, right hand saves the king. Um, moving on to Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verse, chapter 53. Christians often refer to Isaiah 53 uh, very heavily and very frequently when trying to prove that uh, the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, will be crucified. Let us closely examine the entire short chapter of Isaiah 53 to see how they rely on no more than fabrications and translations. And I apologize if I any of you, by the way, I'm trying to, you know, just speak scholarly. And I know this is very uh, dear to some of you. Um, so I apologize in advance. Um, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, says that Jesus, will, the Messiah, will be despised by all men. This is not true. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus had at least 70 followers. And in many other verses, we are told that he fed and healed thousands of people. Okay? That's, you can see John chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, and Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, and others. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, it says, But he was wounded. That's King James Version. Uh, it says wounded, not pierced. Okay? Wounded. It says he was wounded for our transgression. Notice the word wounded, not killed or pierced. Uh, by the way, wounded also means, uh, uh, you know, emotionally wounded. You know, he, he, was, uh, he was in agony, he was uh, in frustration because his people uh, were not following him. And remember, he said, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. You remember that in the New Testament. And the lost sheep, and also Jesus cried with tears when he said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, you that killed the prophets who are sent to thee. For how long will I have to gather you as a chicken gathers, or the hen gathers her chicks? Um, so Jesus was really hurt, you know. I mean, these people are letting him down, and uh, they're just not—they're just not seeing it. And uh, so, yeah, he was hurt. Um, but you know, some of your translations say he was pierced, which is not true. I mean, you know, they make it sound like pierced by a, by a spear. That's not what it says. Okay, Isaiah fifty-three, uh, chapter. Uh, 53 verse 6, we are like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned uh, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of all of us. Jesus said that he was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. That's Matthew chapter 15 verses 22 and through 28. Isaiah 53 verse 6 is speaking about the Jews and their wickedness. It doesn't refer to all humanity, nor does it say that he will be killed for humanity's sins. The verse is simply too vague to draw this conclusion from. Okay? It doesn't say you will die for everyone's sin. It just says that our wickedness was put upon him. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. They are the ones who killed the prophets, just like Jesus said. You who killed the prophets, sent to thee. So, anyway, moving on. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 states that he, will, he did not open his mouth. That is not true, because I... Jesus on the cross, according to, 
to the uh, which I don't believe, agree with, but uh, I don't believe in. But according to, uh, to to the New Testament, Jesus cried uh, to God, "My God, My God, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" So he did open his mouth, and also on the night of crucifixion. Before the crucifixion, Jesus uh, appealed to God, he cried to him, he begged him, he even worshipped him, bowed his face down to the ground as we Muslims do every day in our five sets of daily prayers. Jesus did it once only, according to the New Testament, which is, by the way, an invalid prayer. It's a hypocritical prayer. Sorry if I offend you, because if you want to maximize the glory, the glory of God Almighty, you don't just do it during your desperate times, okay? You do it every time. Okay, so if this is how you want to pray to God by bowing your face to Him, then you have to do it every time. I'm not saying this is how it should be done, but I'm just saying, according to Islam, this is how it should be done. But since you're not Muslim, you know, Jesus told you to pray a certain way, sit on your knee and do things and pray. But when He prayed to God during His desperate time, He bowed His face to the ground to God, which, by the way, rolls away Trinity and Him being God. Um, but anyway, so, you know, if you look at Matthew uh, chapter 16, verse 39, and Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 44, and Luke chapter 6, verse 12, uh, you'll see that Jesus and, uh, prayed endless times, begging God to change his decision. So, yes, he did open his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9 says that he made, he had, uh, that he made his grave with the wicked and the rich. According to www.scripturetext.com slash Isaiah slash 53-9.htm Rewind the tape and listen to it again. Um, in his death is a false translation to the Hebrew mouth, which is death, which is equivalent to the Arabic mouth, which is death, okay? At the worst, it should be translated as in death, which is figurative. And that's exactly how they said it. It says here that this word is uh, figuratively means uh, ruin and, and things like that. So it's a figurative uh, word. So in death here is symbolically referring to the execution trial and not necessarily his physical and literal death. This is further proven in Young's literal translation of the verse which says he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in, uh, in, uh, in through uh, with, I'm sorry with the, with the rich in uh, through he had done no violence uh, through high places I'm sorry and uh, he had done no violence nor was uh, any deceit in his mouth also another important point about this verse is that the verse could very well be referring to the sentencing, sentencing of Jesus death uh, or Jesus to death. After he was sentenced to death, he was assigned a grave. Uh, this certainly does not prove that he will actually die, especially when you read Psalm, especially when you look at it in the light of Psalm 91 and Psalm 116 and 118, as I will get into sh uh, shortly. Um, by the way, there are also two errors in this prophecy because Jesus was never buried by the way. Okay, he was placed in the tomb, which is uh, Book of Matthew chapter 27 verses 59 through 66, and also uh, Matthew chapter 28. Uh, he was temporarily placed in a tomb, and then he disappeared. But he wasn't buried as you and I understand burial, like our, how our dead die. And also, Jesus was never uh, uh, Jesus, whenever was buried from the first place, was also never uh, placed with the, with the wicked ones. Okay, but here it says he will be buried with the rich and the wicked. He was given a tomb of a rich guy, rich man, uh, but he was uh, placed in an isolated area, segregated area. So that prophecy is false. Um, and again, verse 9 says that he was to be buried with both the wicked and the rich, as I just said, Jesus was buried alone. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10 through 11, God Almighty will prolong Jesus' life, and Jesus will live to even see his offspring, his children. Uh, you know, and Christ uh, and the Messiah rather, will, will see the light and be satisfied after the suffering of the soul. Uh, the suffering of the soul here is referring to the overwhelming fear and, that Jesus had and that the countless cries and prayers that he had that he prayed to Allah Almighty to save him. As we saw in Psalm 91, you know, he will, he will cry, I will save him, I will hear him, and I will send my angels to lift him and to protect him. And he will be honored, he will not die. Die. I mean, that, that clearly goes direct clash with, with Crucifixion. One of these books has to be a lie, especially when Jesus confronted that this book is referring to him. Okay, so this is not some speculation from me. Jesus confirmed it in the New Testament. Um, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, it says, um, 
yeah, his life will be poured upon death, you know, which is symbolic, just like the others, like, you know, no one, he will have no followers, which is not true in the New Testament and, and the other verses that I quoted. So, and again, to me, you know, this, this verse about him, his soul will overpower, will be poured over death or will overpower death. Even the Islamic position about Christ never, never get crucified, and given the symbolic speech of Isaiah 53 chapter, uh, uh, three chapter, that most of it conflicts with what really took place with uh, Christ in, in the Gospels, and given the fact that many early writings in Palestine and elsewhere stated clearly that Jesus never got crucified, such as the Apocalypse of Peter and others, texts that I listed on my website, uh, then my interpretation of this verse about Jesus' life being poured unto death means that Jesus' life will overpower death. This is indisputably, indisputably proven in Psalm 91, Psalm 116, and Psalm 118, where it states that Jesus, only Jesus, uh, that, where it states that not only Jesus will not get crucified, but God Almighty will also hear his cries and will send down the angels to protect him and save him. And Psalm 91 also says that, uh, that the person of Christ will call upon God and God Almighty will hear him and will honor him. Okay, that definitely contradicts crucifixion and the humiliation of the crucifixion. Christ would not have been honored if he had died the humiliating death of the cross. And certainly he would not have been saved either by the angels who were supposed to lift him. Psalm 116, moving on, I think I got the minutes here. Psalm 116 verse six here says, uh, when I was in great need, he saved me, saved me. For you, O Lord, have protected my soul from death. I will lift, uh, here, I will lift a cup of salvation, you know, and uh, call on the name of the Lord, you know, which by begging God Almighty uh, all night long, as we have seen. Uh, you have freed me from my chains. That's the chain of the cross and, uh, and death. And in the presence, uh, here it says, and, uh, yeah, so, yeah, you know, you have, you have Freed me from, from my chains. And also here in Psalm 118, verse 5, it says here, uh, In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and He answered by answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid what, uh, you know, what man can do to me. I will not die, but live. Okay? And also here in verse 18 it says, But He has not given me, He has not given me over to death. Okay? He has not given me over to death. Thank you very much. So clearly, there's lots of evidence in the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah 53 itself, the heart of the, of the, of the folks who try to prove, the, 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 the heart of, of, the, of, of proving uh, crucifixion and resurrection, it's, it's just not there. And also, by the way, uh, if you look at answers.com slash Barabbas, capital B, A R A B B. A.S. It talks about here uh, in the Christian story of the passion of Jesus Barabbas. Actually, Barabbas actually was uh, Jesus Barabbas, the son of his father. Jesus Barabbas. Barabbas in, in Arabic means son of his father. Because Jesus Christ had no father. His father was not known. He was called Jesus Barabbas. There was another Jesus who was also called Jesus Barabbas. He was a revolutionist. He, uh, he, uh, he did not like the Romans ruling the, 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 Jew, the Jewish people, the people of God Almighty. You know, since Romans were pagans, and he was a revolutionist, and uh, you know, I believe he killed two Roman soldiers. Um, when uh, uh, the story is very, very long, but here uh, there's a scholar called Chaim Nekadu. Um, he who lived from 1924 to 2004. He talks about uh, the confusion of Baraba when Pilate, Pontius Pilate, uh, asked the crowd, "Which Baraba do you want me to re release?" Now we gotta keep in mind, you know, and they said Barba. Uh, you gotta keep in mind here that uh, you know the Romans, the, the Roman soldiers did not want uh, Jesus Christ to be killed. I mean, the guy did not even hurt a fly. Okay, I mean, he, well, I mean, he killed pigs, you know, to prove his point. At one point, he hurt him. He led them to uh, uh, to the valley, I think, and they fall off or something. But uh, Jesus Christ, in general, was a great man, and uh, he, you know, he did not hurt anybody. He was a righteous man, beautiful. You know, no harm came from him. And uh, so to a pagan Roman, you know, the guy did not deserve to be crucified. I mean, you, you might got to remember, you got to remember, this is capital punishment, okay? This is not just throwing him in jail for a couple of nights for a DUI or something, okay? This is taking his life, you know, in the most painful and bitter way. So to the Romans, he did not deserve to die, okay? So when they call, when, when Pontius Pilate, the story, uh, 
here the guy, Mr. Chaim Maccabee, went into great details of the Greek. And uh, he said that there was omissions done and all that, uh, and uh, to prove that Jesus Christ was the one who was picked. But in, in reality, the people picked Barba because he killed Romans, and the Roman soldiers wanted him dead. So that's that. Um, Okay, uh, and uh, by the way, since we're speaking about resurrection here, uh, where does, I, I'd like to ask this, my respected opponent here, where does the Old Testament speak about the resurrection? Uh, we have already seen how the Bible's Old Testament never stated that the Messiah will be crucified. It only gave statements about him facing troubles and wickedness of his people, but never once did, he, did it say that he will die for anyone's sin. Now please show me where in the Old Testament is the resurrection prophesied for the Messiah. Now Christians in the Old Testament, not Christians, but the New Testament states, and since Christians believe in the New Testament, Christians also claim it, but the New Testament claims that uh, the story of Jonah in the book of Jonah chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 in the Old Testament proves that Jesus will be crucified. Well, the New Testament Matthew chapter 12 verses 39 through 41 states that Jonah's experience being swallowed by the whale and living there the whale's coming and living there for three days and then being saved by God Almighty by having the whales vomit him out to shore uh, proves that uh, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus uh, was going to die and resurrect. Well, there are problems with this story if you want to use it for Jesus. It's not only linked, it, it, not only it never was linked to the Messiah in the Old Testament, it was never linked, not even once, to the Messiah in the entire Old Testament. We never heard any scripture, any verse in the Old Testament say that this story is going to be uh, 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 a parable for the Messiah. Never. Not only that, but also proves actually Islam's position because Jonah was never killed or, nor died. He instead was swallowed by the whale and lived by God Almighty's will and was rescued by God Almighty. Jesus' crucifixion on the, uh, on the cross is a crucifixion by death in the New Testament. The entire case for Christianity is 100% reliant upon it. As Paul stated, as our respected uh, Mrs. Uh, Mary Jo stated in her uh, opening statement, uh, that you know, if, if, uh, if Christ is not died on the, on the cross, then Christianity's belief is in vain, uh, or something, down, something in that, around that line. And again, here, if Jesus was never killed, then Jesus never died for anyone's sin, and hence Christianity would be false. So you cannot use Jonah's experience, because Jonah, Jonah never died. Therefore, Jonah's story, which again, the Old Testament never linked to the Messiah whatsoever, show me that verse, please, uh, goes to further prove that Christianity is false. And by the way, since our, my respected opponent spoke about uh, Trinity, I'd like to refute it with a few verses from the New Testament. John verses, uh, chapter of Book of John in the New Testament, chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus said, I do nothing of myself. Chap uh, book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. John, chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus said, I am returning to my God and your God, my God and your God. Okay, Mark, chapter 10, verse 18, said, Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good, absolutely no one, except God Almighty alone. And see also Luke chapter 18, verse 19, he said the same thing. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus said, No one knows when the hour will come, only God Almighty knows. They asked him, When is the hour coming? Okay, judgment day. He said, No one knows. I don't know. No one knows, except only God knows. How can he be God? Come on, you know. So, about the last position, I have, you know, Explain that, and uh, it's the noble verse. The noble Quran says, "Allah Almighty have raised him to Himself," which, by the way, goes in perfect harmony with uh, an agreement with uh, Psalm 91, which God will send His angels to lift him and, and, and lift him and protect him. There you have it. The Quran said it. And by the way, God Almighty said, "Shub bihalam." It was made appear to them. It appeared to them. It looked like to them that they thought that he was crucified. Christians say that God created this lie. You know, called uh, you know Christianity, assuming Islam is true. That's Christian uh, argument. They say that, well, yeah, but God, you know, created this lie called Christianity, right? No, God said should be alone. He did not say should be alone. He did not say we made it appear to them like this. We made this lie. No, God said 
they thought that he was crucified. Yeah, it was their fault. I mean, their, their, their problem, their, uh, their errors, their wickedness, they were spinning around them. They were spinning around themselves due to their wickedness. God Almighty had nothing to do with it. So they thought he was crucified, but he did not get crucified. And the Old Testament proves that. A um, few errors in the Bible's account since my opponent's book about history. Uh, first of all, in the uh, book of uh, two, 2 Timothy chapter, th uh, three verse, one, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, and 2 Samuel, second book of Samuel chapter 22, verse 31, and Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, and Psalm chapter 18, verse 3, 30 rather, and book of Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, they say God Almighty's words are flawless, they're errorless, they're perfect. Okay, yet we see here in the Bible about Barabbas, in John chapter 18, verse 40, it says he was a robber. In Luke chapter 23, verse 19, he was a murderer. In uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 7, he was an uh, 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 insurrectionist. And uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 16, he was a notorious prisoner. Uh, and here, uh, about, uh, okay, what did, and also another error here, it says, what did the inscription on Jesus' cross say? John chapter 19, verse 19, it says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The inscription that was printed on his cross. One, yeah? Thank you. Uh, Jesus, uh, John chapter 19, verse 19 says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Matthew chapter 27, verse 37, it says, This is Jesus, the king of the Jews, no Nazareth. Luke chapter 23, verse 38, This is the king of the Jews, no Jesus, no Nazareth. Okay? Mark chapter 15, verse 26, The king of the Jews, not even, not, no Jesus, no Nazareth, no, no nothing. So, uh, by the way, I mean, there's only one cross, okay, for Jesus, not ten. Okay? If we cannot even get this account straight and accurate in the Bible, okay, about what the cross said, how can you trust anything in the Bible, in the New Testament accounts? And, uh, oh. How am I doing that? Uh, well, I was going to go through more errors. Uh, Genesis chapter 11, verse, verse uh, verses 1 through 9. 